Welcome back to another episode of Ramiumptum Ruminations. I'm the host, Scott. Today's episode is called Cafeteria Mormonism. Today's episode is going to be a bit of an extension on last week's, where we discussed Immanuel Kant and his and his interpretation of how we understand what we perceive. So for a quick recap, before we jump too far into cafeteria Mormonism, I want to paraphrase what we talked about last week. Kant explained that we perceive the world around us through the influence of our perspective. So everything that we see, everything we observe, is influenced by what we know, what we believe, and who we are as a person. And all of those things influence how we see the world. We discussed a couple of thought experiments that explained it, and we talked about how This concept is what prevents people from seeing the truth when it is right in front of them. Because they literally cannot. Because their perception is influenced by their beliefs. We're going to talk a little bit about cafeteria Mormonism. I like this concept. Because it is something that gets thrown out to nuanced members regularly. As a way to say that they're not orthodox enough. But there's a beautiful irony in all of this, because I believe that every member of the church is a cafeteria Mormon. Every single member. So let's jump into this. Let's dissect this thought experiment of cafeteria Mormonism. This idea of cafeteria Mormonism has been around for a while. I've heard lots of memes, both both faithful and on the other side of the spectrum, about the subject of cafeteria Mormonism. So let's go over it briefly. The idea is that everyone in the Mormon church attends a cafeteria of the religion. Each choice of food or drink is a different doctrine or principle of the church. And members are are instructed to eat every single food item. When people talk about cafeteria Mormonism, on both the believing and the non-believing side, there's a couple of things that they discuss. From the believing perspective, the concept is that a member of the church is not allowed to determine what does and does not constitute orthodoxy, and they have to obey what is being taught and trust what is being taught by their leaders. The irony is If we talk about Mormonism as this cafeteria, these leaders regularly take food items off the menu. They change things. And this was something that we've established already in this this podcast. If you're interested in more facts and, and dissecting the details a little bit more, you should go check out some of the other podcasts. Radio Free Mormon, Thinker on Thoughts and Stuff. Some of these guys that dissect these ideas more thoroughly. Now, I love this example because of something that no one talks about. That is the obvious next step in the parable of cafeteria Mormonism. If we're going to liken doctrine and policy and theology to food, that no two people has the same exact taste in food. There are not two people in the world that would go to the buffet and like every single same item on the menu. Now for me... It's spice all the way, as much heat as I can handle. I love spicy food. I have a bottle of sriracha in my refrigerator that I put on my breakfast. My wife recently got me a gift set of different hot sauces, different um, different chili peppers, habaneros, mixed with garlic and, and different sort of flavors that 
that just, oh, just makes the food so good. Now, I love spicy food. I love a wide variety of foods, but there are certain things that I don't like. And that's the same with everyone. Everyone has unique tastes. Everyone has unique needs when they're, when they're eating. Some people are allergic to foods. Taking the concept of cafeteria Mormonism and being allergic to foods, you can push that idea pretty far and, and draw some interesting conclusions there. There are no two people that are going to resonate with the same ideas that will feel what they identify to be the spirit from the same two talks. Yes, there are many people that will agree and that will resonate with similar ideas, but that doesn't mean they'll resonate with everything exactly the same. It's funny because these prophets and, and leaders of the church are changing the menu at the cafeteria of Mormonism, and the members don't notice. They don't pay attention to that. They don't realize that the menu of courses is different than the one that their parents ate or that their grandparents ate. It is a constantly rotating theology. Members are encouraged to eat their fill and have a bite of every single food item on the menu. Now this is where I want to push the example a little bit further. Now let's say we have a group of people walking into this buffet, this, this Mormon buffet of ideologies and policies. It is silly to assume that everyone is going to like everything at the buffet. Every member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a cafeteria Mormon. Without question, everyone picks and chooses the doctrines that resonate with them, the teachings that connect with them. And I will make a point to illustrate this. We all sat through a gospel doctrine class where the teacher said something or somebody raised their hand and made a comment that didn't jive with you and that you just brushed off and said, oh, I, well, I disagree with that. Well, the person that said it does not disagree with that, and it jives with their version of Mormonism. So they're eating a slightly different meal. My wife was often frustrated sitting through gospel doctrine with me because I would regularly cite scripture and tear down the ideas presented and, and whisper to her in the background why what they said was wrong and why what they said did not jive with what the prophets had taught. But it never occurred to me that the way it was presented by the teacher at the time meshed with their version of Mormonism. The way they practiced the religion was different than the way I practiced it. One of the other aspects of this, and the fact that each member believes a different thing, is that each member has studied the scriptures to a different amount. And so... Someone who only reads the scriptures and only goes to church on Sunday will have a different view of the religion than someone who studies, who does this and also studies general conference talks. To compound that, someone who reads the books that the apostles and prophets publish will also have a different view of the religion. And each different thing that someone reads, let's say, for example, one person studies what the older prophets taught, you know, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, reads Journal of Discourses. This person is going to have a, whole, a fully different view of the religion than someone who only reads the books written by prophets of the modern day, books written by the current prophet and the current apostles. These two people that are studying different, different writings of church leaders will have different views of the church because each prophet, each apostle does have a different view and their rhetoric is different. This compounds the fact that each member has a different level of understanding of the doctrine and adds to this, this idea of cafeteria Mormonism. Each of these people are partaking of different meals in the cafeteria. They're studying the Mormon doctrine books. They're studying the Jesus the Christ. They're studying different books on the menu that not everyone else is, is studying. Perhaps me making the argument that every member of the church is a cafeteria Mormon is just a bit of semantics. The point that I'm trying to put across is that every single member of the church has a different understanding of it, and they interface with it just a little bit different than everyone else. And that's normal. 
when people weaponize and say, you can't be a cafeteria Mormon, they're disregarding the fact that everyone in the church, everyone in the church interfaces with it in their own way. You might have one person who was raised in a family that their parents are very devout, wear their church clothes all day on Sunday, or do family night every Monday and read scriptures every day. Or you may have come from a family that only one of your parents was a member of the church and scripture study was not a part of your, of your formative years. There are all of these subtle differences with the way that people interact with the church that make it so each person has a unique experience with it. Each member, no matter how devout, is a cafeteria Mormon. Their understanding of the scriptures is just different than yours. Let that sink in for a sec. Their understanding is different than yours. Does that mean that they believe different than you? I think it does. And I am making the argument that every member of the church is a cafeteria Mormon because they believe different things. It might be subtle. Sometimes it's just a few small things. Sometimes it's rigidity to every word the prophets have said. Sometimes it's that flexibility of saying, ah, oh, sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they don't say everything that's, that's the word of God. Regardless, there is a belief spectrum and every member of the church is on it. And therefore, every member of the church is a cafeteria Mormon. Now, I want to cover briefly a couple of the things that I found unpalatable. There were dishes in this cafeteria of Mormonism that I just did not like. This is not a complete list. I want to say that I did not know that the church hurt minority groups and, and women until much later. So this list was the, the list of things that bothered me while I was still a member of the church, still a fully believing member of the church. We all had our shelf that we talk about we're not using the shelf analogy. We're using the cafeteria Mormon analogy. So in my, in my cafeteria version of Mormonism, here were a couple of things that I did not eat and did not agree with. While I was sitting in, in Sunday school and the subject of same-sex marriage came up. And that bothered me ever since I was in high school. In 2004, in Multnomah County in Oregon, same-sex marriage was briefly allowed before it was taken down again. And in that time, some 3,000 couples were married. And this became a subject of debate, and I just wondered at it. It just didn't make sense to me why we cared so much about somebody else's marriage. It just never made sense to me. Can't we just let people live their lives? Isn't that part of agency? That was, that was how I reasoned this. I was in college during Prop 8, and they had... They had a meeting where they called everyone in that lived in California. And I went with this girl that lived in California because why not? <laughs> and I was sitting with this girl, listening to them teach us about how evil it was for, for men to marry men and women to marry women. And I sat there with her watching the whole congregation listening to this and I felt like I was the only one uncomfortable in the entire room. And that, that feeling never really went away. Whenever the subject was brought up, I, I just never understood why it mattered. And maybe at the time, it wasn't as much of a theological difference. It was more, if we can live our way, why can't they live their way? And as I got older... My view of this slowly shifted into me completely agreeing that anyone is allowed to live their life the way that they choose so long as they don't hurt their fellow man or woman. I didn't realize it at the time, but that moment right there shifted me away from orthodox belief and pushed me into progressive Mormonism. Now, this simple concept of holding one idea separate from the rest of the membership means that I was eating a different version of cafeteria Mormonism, but I was still active and believing. 
you'll see members of the church often say, you can't be a cafeteria Mormon. You can't pick and choose which doctrines to believe in. But everyone does it. Period. Now, I'll quickly list a couple more that bothered me. But as I got older and learned more and studied the scriptures and studied history, many more things became unpalatable to me in this cafeteria of Mormonism. The next one that really bothered me was biblical historicity, both from the Tanakh or the Old Testament and the New Testament. I haven't discussed my faith journey exhaustively yet, but I'll briefly explain that I lost belief in the Old Testament first. I have always been a history enthusiast. And as I was researching ancient Egypt, for fun, because that's just who I am, (laughs) I came across this historian who made an offhanded comment. He said, those that believe that Abraham existed place him somewhere in this time period. And it caught me off guard. Those that believe he existed, well, of course he existed. And then that sent me down this rabbit hole that led me to the documentary hypothesis and eventually Joseph Friedman Elliott, and I read book after book after book and came to the conclusion that it is not history. It's legend and myth. I tried to reconcile the fact that it was not historical, and I continued to participate in the church even though I did not believe that some of these people were real people. Long before I left the church, I stopped believing that the scriptures were historical documents. I still read them. I read them allegorically, but I was never allowed to speak about this. Because if I did, then it would give away that I have a different version of Mormonism. Even though I still believed in everything else, prophets and and revelation and the priesthood, I did not believe the scriptures were true. One of the next food items that I took off of my my plate, if you will, was evolution. And how that does not, and how the science does not add up with the cosmology in the Old Testament. It just doesn't. But this was okay because, because I was developing a more metaphorical understanding of Genesis and I was in a space where that was okay. It was okay to believe that that they were just talking about the universe as they saw it at the time and not receiving direct inspiration of how it was created. This next one is one that I grappled with for a long time. As a young man, I felt the spirit while reading scriptures. I felt inspired and I felt like I was learning good things. But as I got older, I did not have that feeling while reading the scriptures that tingling, burning sensation that they discuss. Instead, I found it while reading books. I found it while watching movies and while playing video games even. That burning sensation that that the church refers to as the spirit was nowhere near church. Instead, I found it in literature and art. It was stories. It was was human connection that really helped me feel what at the time I referred to as the spirit. And and that just didn't make sense to me. Why could I not feel the spirit while listening to the prophets, but instead while listening to the great poets of the world? So gradually, I turned to poetry and literature to find inspiration and to find meaning and value and to edify myself. I've since changed my view on what the spirit is in regards to concepts such as elevation emotion, but I don't want to get too far into that. I've already ranted a little bit too long on this. Now, as a believing member, or (laughs) unknown to me at the time as a progressive member, I never considered myself that, but I was. I found myself theologically pushed to the fringes. If I commented or spoke too openly about my thoughts, I would out myself as being nuanced. And so I did my best to hide my beliefs. This was very hard as the gospel doctrine teacher for a a number of years. I struggled. I had to word things so carefully so as not to give myself away. I had to make sure that as I taught these stories, I, 
I taught them in a way that didn't let on that I did not believe that they were historical. Teaching the Old Testament while not believing that it literally happened was a challenge that I took head on, and I feel like I did a great job because I incorporated the history that I had been studying into the lessons that I taught. It was an interesting dance, and I tried to teach everything in a way that they would be able to to read the stories in the same way that I read literature, because I, I still do find value in a lot of the scriptures. I find value in the teachings, but I do not think that they're historical, and I do not look at them as proof that God exists. Now, what can we do with this problem? We have members on the full spectrum of belief that have this whole system of thought that no longer works for them. We have deconstructed religion. We have decided that it's not true. We have read and studied, and and maybe we're still in. Maybe we're deciding to, to still be a member and make it work. What can we do about this? It's important to note that this, this idea of Kantian understanding of the world, that we perceive it through this lens that we've created, well, each of us have created a unique lens to see the world, a different way to perceive and understand the world around us. That's no different in Mormonism. But we trick ourselves to believe that every single person in the church agrees with the exact same doctrines and policies. When that's not the truth, that's not the case by any stretch of the imagination. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this, both as a believer and a non-believer, anywhere on this whole belief spectrum? What do you do when you find something in cafeteria Mormonism to be unpalatable? I want to look to Buddhism for a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of understanding on how we can interpret this and live healthier lives. This is a Buddhist parable that I think will help us retain autonomy and the ability to decide for ourselves, and from there also help us heal after finding the truth about the church and the harm and the hurt that you that we feel after that change. This is a quote from the Alagadupama Sutta, the water snake simile. I may have butchered that. This is translated from the Pali by Thanissaro Bhikkhu. Now, this is a story of a man traveling by a river with a raft. And it's often referred to as the parable of the raft. The Blessed One said, Suppose a man were traveling along a path. He would see a great expanse of water, with the near shore dubious and risky and the further shore secure and free from risk, but neither a ferry boat nor a bridge going from this shore to the other. What if I were to gather grass, twigs, branches, and leaves, and having bound them together to make a raft were to cross over to safety on the other shore, in dependence on the raft, making an effort with my hands and feet? Having crossed over to the further shore, he might think, how useful this raft has been to me, For it was in dependence on this raft that making an effort with my hands and feet I have crossed over to safety on the further shore. Why don't I, having hoisted it on my head or carrying it on my back, go wherever I like? (laughs) So let's illustrate this idea. A man comes to a river and he must cross to the other side. So he decides to build a raft. And the raft takes him across safely. And he gets to the other side and he thinks to himself, this raft was very useful. And he decides to put the raft on his back and continue walking down the path. This is an interesting parable of the things that we carry with us that we may not need anymore. Not just the usefulness. Sometimes we carry around hurt. We carry around relationships and ideas with us that have stopped being useful to us. They helped for a time. They helped us heal. They helped us get from point A to point B, but we continue to hold them with us. Now, is there anything wrong with deciding what works and doesn't work for you? What ideas or concepts live in our minds well after they've run out of usefulness? How often in our lives do we cross that river, that hypothetical river, 
and pick up whatever carried us across it and keep it with us. In my life, Mormonism was that raft for a very long time. I used it to navigate adolescence and my 20s. I used it to define who I was, define my beliefs and my ideas. But when I got to the other side of the river, I no longer needed the raft. And in my own life, I actually did pick it up and I carried it with me for a long time after it was no longer necessary. Until I eventually put it down. There is deep value in understanding the things that we need and the things that we don't need anymore. Even as a believing member of the church, there can be individual doctrines, individual ideas that you don't need to carry with you. If they don't bring you happiness, then they are not for you. I suffered from scrupulosity when I was a member of the church because of poor choices that I made in my youth, because of continued poor choices I made as an adult. And I was stricken by a constant awareness of my mortality and the fact that one day I will die. And that could happen at any moment. And I lived in this constant fear of not being ready for it. And it wasn't until I put down that raft of Mormonism that I learned that, that there was nothing to get ready for. I'm living a full life. And if I die today, that would be just fine. Because I've, I have had many wonderful years living among many wonderful people. And I found peace in that. But while I was in the church, there was no peace in my mind. And it took me stepping away to find that peace. Even though I did step away mentally, I participated for years with my spouse. This leaving the raft behind us is a profound concept. I want to be clear that I have very fond memories growing up in the church. I overall had a good experience in my adolescence in the church. The raft was good for a time, but I no longer need it. Now these rafts can be many different things. They can be relationships. They can be emotions. Many people that leave the church hang on to the grief and the anger and the frustration for far too long. They carry that, that raft that helped them. These, these emotions, these, these bitter and hard emotions that guide you through a faith transition and religious deconstruction. They're painful, but useful in guiding us down a path to a healthier state of mind. But how many of us hang on to those emotions for far too long? Maybe there are some listeners that, that exist in a state of anger and frustration. And that's not a healthy place to be either. That doesn't mean you can't get mad. That doesn't mean you can't be frustrated. It doesn't mean you can't stand up for the things that you believe in. Something that you'll see in Reddit posts as people are deconstructing and angry and frustrated is, they, frustrated, is they'll discuss how mad they are that they wasted so many years in the church or how frustrated they are that that it took them so long to see it for what it really is. There's no use in thought patterns like that. It is already done. You can be mad. Feeling your emotions is okay. But you can't be mad at yourself because you did not know. And this church was a raft for all of us. Carried us through trials and turmoil and tragedy and heartache but I don't need to carry it with me. The raft held me back as an adult and stifled my ability to think for myself. It forced me to place ideas within a framework that did not work. Think back to the, the green lens and Kantian understanding of, of the way we perceive the world around us. As a Mormon, I was literally unable to see truth in front of me because I was conditioned to ignore it. At first, it is hard to look back at the Mormon church without resentment. I understand that. 
without feelings of hurt and pain. And for many of us, the church did significantly hurt us. Myself, I battled with scrupulosity, depression, suicidality, anxiety, all because of the teachings of the church. But as a kid, I didn't have any of those things, and it was good, and it gave me community and a good place to grow up. The raft was useful for a time. Maybe eventually it'll make the changes necessary to be a better organization. But my view on it doesn't matter. It's a raft that I put down at the side of the river as I continued on my path. I don't need to carry it with me. I guess you could say that I am a little bit in making this podcast, that I am carrying the raft with me as I record these episodes of this podcast because I'm focusing on Mormonism and and understanding it through these different lenses. But I would say that maybe, maybe I'm still on that river to some extent, but I have put down the pieces of the church that were harmful to me, put down the theology, and I'm trying to better understand myself and better understand other people. And together we're on this journey to, to enlightenment. On many occasions I prayed whenever I was troubled, whenever something bad happened, I would pray. And the church was the interface with which I managed my emotions. And as a kid, it worked fine. And for all of us that are on this spectrum, at one point in time, it was healthy. Otherwise, we would not have joined or continued on as we have. It's also valid to decide that the raft is still good for you. And maybe you sail down that river a little bit further. That's okay too. I want to be clear that I don't use this parable as a way to encourage everyone to leave. Everyone's journey is their own. Everyone has different reasons for staying and different reasons for leaving. I believe if the organization makes certain changes that it can be good and helpful. So as I discussed with Cafeteria Mormonism, whether you stay or leave, wherever you find yourself on this spectrum of belief, there's nothing wrong with avoiding certain meals in the cafeteria. Consider them their own individual rafts, beliefs that you held for a time that were helpful, beliefs that, that, that shaped the way you see the world. But if they don't work for you anymore, you can put them down. I will say this. There are certain foods in this cafeteria that are poisonous and will kill certain people. They are to be avoided and they should be removed from the menu so that it can be a healthier space for everyone. I often wonder what life would have been like had I never been a member of the church. I think we all have these what-if thoughts, these ideas that we, we wonder, what if I had made that other choice? What if life had been just a little different? That thought pattern is normal. Many people wonder. I mean, many people second-guess themselves. I, for a long time, second-guessed my choice to leave the church. It was the hardest decision I ever made in my life. And for many of my listeners, that will be the case for you too. It was the hardest choice you ever made. And you doubt and second-guess yourself. But as you've been on the path to healing, you can put that raft down and continue your journey wherever your heart takes you. Every single member of the church is a cafeteria Mormon. Remember that next time you discuss something with your family. Each member of the family has their own individual understanding of what the religion is. Thank you for listening today. If this is content that you enjoy, I would really appreciate you putting in a like, sharing it with your friends. As a new podcast, I rely on word of mouth. I rely on you guys to get the word out that I'm here trying to help. I want to create a space where believers and non-believers can discourse. I feel that that is the only way that we can make positive change in the church. 
And I have loved ones that don't want the organization to go away. So if we want to change it, if we want to make it a healthier space for our loved ones, we need to discourse in a way that will reach them. There's space for other discourse. There is space for people to be angry, for people to learn facts that might be off-putting to to believers. There also needs to be a space for believers to listen and get the perspective of a nuanced believer or a post-Mormon in order to better understand where we're coming from. I hope that you have an excellent day.